I started wor working with black bears about 25 years ago and I came at it from rather an unusual angle. I graduated from the University of New Hampshire in 1974 with a bachelor's degree in wildlife. I hope to go on to graduate school to do the kind of work I'm doing today, but unfortunately I'm dyslexic and my grade scores and test scores were well below par and I failed to get into graduate school. As a result, I went west to a trade school and learned the art of gunsmithing and have employed myself as a custom gunsmith and gun designer over 30 years. In 1982, uh, my wife Debbie and I returned to New Hampshire and I still had it in my mind that I wanted to do the kind of work I wanted to do. I had a leg up on this because my father, Lawrence Killam, who was a virologist at the Dartmouth Medical School, studied birds as an avocation. He wrote four books on natural history, uh, one of them, The Woodpeckers of the Eastern United States, and a book on crows and ravens. He published over 125 journal articles on birds. So I grew up in a household with lots of wild animals around. When I was two, my dad went on sabbatical to Africa for a year and brought a half-grown leopard into the house, much to my mother's chagrin. <laughs> my younger sister, Phoebe, uh, was one at the time. She currently helps me with the bears. Uh, and my next oldest brother, Josh, was four. Uh, one night, uh, Josh woke up screaming with the leopard at the end of his bed. Uh, but needless to say, we all survived and returned from Africa with two African hornbills and a Nile crocodile that my dad raised in a basement shower until it was six feet long and the National Zoo came and picked it up. In 1961, we came to New Hampshire when I was nine years old. My dad continued his work with wildlife. Uh, we had all kinds of, of wildlife. He had permits to keep just about everything. So we, we had a beaver in the kitchen that leveled the floor and dammed up the toilet. <laughs> we had a, a porcupine in the greenhouse next to his study. Uh, we had fox and woodchuck and uh, hawks and owls and woodpeckers and aviaries and crows and ravens. Uh, so I, I had a good experience growing up uh, uh, with wild, wild animals. And when my time came along, I was interested in carnivores. And carnivores present a bit of a problem to study. Uh, any of you who have been in the woods, you're lucky enough to get a glimpse of one. They disappear rapidly into the brush, and there's not much opportunity to study their behavior. My dad prided himself on simple apparatus. He had a pair of binoculars and a small folding chair, and he and my mother would take turns watching woodpecker nests, documenting courtship and behavior. But again, carnivores are another story. I had to come up with a different plan. And I realized with, from my childhood experience that I could walk a, an orphan animal loose in the forest, untethered, and, and it would follow me. And uh, I thought that if I uh, walked them that way, I could learn their, their juvenile behavior, and that would help me understand adult behavior. I wasn't thinking about black bears because there was no formal rehabilitation of black bears in most of New England. I was thinking more along the lines of a coyote or a bobcat or perhaps a fisher, the large woodland weasel we have. My sister Phoebe and I became licensed wildlife rehabilitators, uh, me with the hope of getting an animal I could study, and Phoebe was interested in husbandry. Uh, but after two years, none of those animals came my way. And then one day, a conservation officer broke departmental policy, brought us an 11-month-old black bear cub that he thought had been hit by an automobile. It turned out it had not been hit by an automobile, had no infectious disease, yet it had the shakes and wobbles and couldn't climb or stay on a branch. I was interested in finding out what the cause of the illness was, but lacking a permit, the animal was quickly confiscated from me. And uh, uh, later that spring, I got a call from the director of Fish and Game, and he asked me if I'd take that bear back. And uh, I told him I would, and I told him, as I told him in the beginning, that I wanted to know what caused the illness. Uh, there's a lot of things happen to wild animals, but they die in the forest, and we don't learn much from them. So we, kept, we took care of this animal until so it could no longer fend for itself, and we had to euthanize it. We sent the brain out to the wildlife disease lab in Wyoming and got a diagnosis of lysosomal storage disease. The human equivalent of that is Tay-Sachs and is caused by uh, inbreeding in the population. This was the first documented case of lysosomal storage disease in black bears. And uh, since that time, there have been two more cases in New Hampshire, 
two in Massachusetts, one in Maine, and more recently one out in Wyoming. The likely cause of this disease in the wild population is the fact in the 1850s, 85% of the land was open agricultural land. The forest habitat of the black bear was uh, gone, greatly fragmented or gone, and the black bear populations were reduced to small island populations where this type of inbreeding might have occurred. On top of that, there was 125 years of bounties on black bears, so their, their populations were really fragmented. Uh, the, it, it's potentially an important disease because for every cub that's born with it, uh, there's, a cub, there's a cub born without it and two cubs that are carriers. And any time the carriers mate, the disease rises again. And the fact that we're still seeing them is an indication that it exists uh, uh, fairly substantially in the population. Later that spring, I got a call from Forrest Hammond from Vermont Fish and Wildlife. He had two orphan cubs as a result of the Stratton Mountain Bear Study. And he called me up, heard about what I was interested in doing, and asked me if I'd take the two cubs. And I said, well, there's this little problem of a permit. I said, New Hampshire's pretty sensitive. And I said, if you'll call New Hampshire and they're willing to grant me a permit, I'll take the cubs. Well, the next morning, I had a permit in hand. And <laughs> since that time, we've raised and returned to the wild, re rehabilitated and returned to the wild over 200 black bear cubs. This year, uh, we started the Kill em Bear Center, and, and we got our 501c3 in August. And the idea of the Kill and Bear Center is to continue the work that I'm doing, uh, continue educating people, uh, continue taking in bear cubs, and uh, make an effort to get some of the work that I've done out into the scientific community. Uh, I got my PhD a few years ago from Drexel University, um, but I'm still dyslexic, and I still put words in there that the scientists would rather not see. Uh, and so it would be very helpful to have a postdoc working with us that, uh, that had the skills that I don't have that, and get some of this work out. Uh, potentially, it, it's quite valuable not only for bears but for humans as well, as I will let you know in this talk. <laughs> some of the cubs come to us very young before they have experience with their mothers outside the den. Uh, these little cubs. Uh, were last year's cubs. Uh, two of them came from the Keene area uh, where an excavator dug into a brush pile. Uh, it's not unusual in uh, new housing development for them to clear the lot and pile up big piles of brush in the summer and burn them in the winter. And when he dug into the pile, the mother ran out and uh, it was too dramatic of a situation for her to return and they ended up with us. This little guy was we nicknamed Stripies because he had two white stripes in his chest, but he was uh, a little bit of a character. <laughs> and all this wobbliness of them, uh, the, some veterinarians thought they had neurological problems, but the reality is they, they are, have a built-in wobble so they can't escape the den. If they get away from their mother's warmth, they freeze to death. And here are the three, all, all of the cubs uh, together. And we get some uh, in the spring, we call them star starving yearlings. They can come in in pretty bad shape. This, this cub was a full-size cub. It weighed 15 pounds. Uh, it was dehydrated and, and hypothermic and, and frostbit, all that bare skin on its ears. We had to give it subcutaneous fluids and heat and got it revived and we were able to release it about a month and a half uh, uh, later weighing over 45 pounds. Uh, so these guys are survivors and they do very well. And this is a little stripey after his release uh, this spring looking back and uh, going about his, his way. We use outdoor enclosures. Uh, we have an eight acre and a 10 acre enclosure. Uh, there's 12 bears in this picture in case you want to count. Uh, these, these enclosures have uh, oak stands, wetlands, ponds, and a, these big pine escape trees where the cubs like to spend their time. 
And there's, uh, they get a good education. Not only are they coming from different families and make friends among each other, but socially there's bears on the outside of the fence. Uh, so they're, they're getting an education from the wild bears as well as the bears that are inside the enclosure. They get to learn that there's two sides to that fence. And this is Thanksgiving time last year. Uh, somebody in our town, his apples got a little soft in his garage and, and gave them to us. My, my interest has been in the study of behavior and this chart is something I put together to assemble my observations. Uh, you won't be able to read it, but you can see it's rather complex and the pictures around the edges are like what I'm doing tonight, showing pictures of the behavior I talk about. And when I started working with black bears, they were considered to be solitary animals. That is, the only interaction they had with their own kind was with their cubs, their mates, and they knew they uh, congregated at concentrated food sources. But beyond that, they knew very little about them. And what I found is they're really highly social animals, but they're not social in the way we think of a pack of wolves or a group of chimpanzees that have fixed territories and family units living within those territories with alpha animals allocating resources down through the family group. Bears would like to do that, uh, but the closest they come to a territory is the female home range. She's relatively territorial over it. And their food supply is the highest quality foods in the forest, the nuts, berries, ants, bees, and grubs. And these foods are generally available in patches that are unevenly distributed on the landscape and the crops are affected by uh, droughts and, and frosts and, and seasonal changes. So as an example, last year was a, a huge food year. Uh, there was abundance of acorns and beech nuts and apples. This year is a bust. There's hardly any food in the forest. And in a typical year, one female bear may have a huge surplus of food in her home range and her neighbor could have nothing. This has led to a system of sharing over time that I believe that these female bears are reciprocal altruists. And uh, uh, that's what we are. That's our social behavior. That means a tit for a tat with a time delay in the middle. So if your neighbor invites you over for dinner, uh, you feel obligated to invite him back over for dinner at a later time. So Squirty, uh, a bear that I'll be talking about, uh, uh, tonight, uh, a bear that I raised and has established herself, she controls an oak ridge and her neighbor Moose controls 23,000 acres of beach. And in a year when there's no beech nuts and only acorns, Moose and all her family members come onto Squirty's ground. In years when there's only beech nuts and no acorns, Squirty and her family members go onto Moose's ground. And it's a system that allows them to, to uh, diminish the amount of aggression that would be needed in protecting resources by sharing with friends. The cubs that I used in this study were the very young cubs uh, that came to me before. They had the experience with their mothers outside the dens. These cubs were bottle feeders. They were dependent on me and I decided they could use an education and I could use one myself. So I took them for long walks in the forest up to nine hours at a time and returned them safely to a remote enclosure. I was able to observe their very first reaction to their natural environment. I saw their tongues coming out and sticking to an object, lifting scent off that object, bringing the scent back to a small bump behind their front teeth. This bump is called the papilla of the vomeronasal organ. Uh, bears, like your cats and dogs at home, have two olfactory systems, the vomeronasal system and the nasal epithelium. As humans, we only have the nasal epithelium. Uh, the vomeronasal system is used to identify new scent, and the nasal epithelium learns from the vomeronasal system and is able to locate and later identify scent. This behavior in these young cubs was very exaggerated, very easy to observe. The same behavior in adults is very subtle and very difficult to observe. So I had the advantage of learning the behavior associated with smell, something that was in, uh, invisible and other scientists didn't think you could observe uh, by this relationship. I followed several of these bears into adulthood. Uh, one of them was a bear named Yoda who lived for five and a half years and raised one set of cubs. But the main bear that I've worked with is this bear. Her name is Squirty. 
Uh, Squirty came to me as a three pound cub. I walked her loose in the forest. Uh, I followed her, uh, put a telemetry collar on her and followed her into the forest as an adult. And not only was she successful at establishing her own home range, but as she, as she expanded her home range, she dropped a daughter into the expanded area. And now she controls a greater home range that she shares with a number of adult daughters and granddaughters. Squirty is now uh, 23 years old with her 11th litter of cubs. And I've had the privilege of, of watching her raise those cubs and watching her daughters and granddaughters raise cubs as well. Squirty manages uh, her, her greater home range in a matrilinear hierarchy. Uh, this is Squirty, her oldest daughter, SQ2, a younger granddaughter, uh, SNLO, a, 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 do, a young daughter, uh, uh, Brooke, and another adult um, granddaughter, two, and a subadult, SQ2LO. It's a matrilinear hierarchy because Squirty on site will chase all the bears below her in the hierarchy. The number two bear chases all the bears below her. The number three bear chases all the bears below her. And everybody chases SQ2LO. <laughs> The result of this hierarchy is that in a marginal food year, like this year, Squirty will have access to the highest quality foods in the greater home range. And it ensures that at least one of these females will be able to reproduce, even if there's not much food around. But in a year like last year, a year of abundance, all the females that were ready to reproduce would have reproduced. And uh, um, the second thing that it does, it allows a place for these sub-adult females to stay even if they don't have a, a, ho a home range open for them. Uh, but there's a price because they're being chased all the time. Normally they'd give birth for the first time at age three, uh, but this, it's then delayed to age four, five, six, or even seven years old. Uh, so. Um, so the bears have the means of managing their own population based on a natural food supply. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing natural about the bear's food supply. The amount of human foods that enter the food chain is tremendous, uh, not only from our bird seed, but our dumpsters and unsecured garbage, uh, agricultural crops, and even logging increases the number of female home ranges that the landscape can support. Uh, the young males that came into my study site were quickly chased out or into these female home ranges. In this picture, Squirty's going after a grandson. Uh, I watched this little guy get chased more than 30 times, uh, not only by his grandmother, but by his mother, by his aunts, and any other bear that could get a target on him. By September of his second year, he left the greater home range and joined the population of male bears in the upper valley. This is SQ2LO as an adult, and she's chasing a male bear uh, out of the study site. The large males that came into my study site, and I'll take a moment to explain the study site. Uh, it's on a piece of property that Debbie and I own. It's about 400 acres. It's a mile off the nearest dirt road in town. I drive up there every evening unless I'm uh, giving a talk, and then I go up early, uh, and I provide a small amount of corn to any bear that shows up. Some nights no bears show up and some nights quite a few bears show up. I've been documenting social interactions between bears. I've documented more than 1,500. Uh, it's been the basis of my thesis that I did for my PhD. Uh, it's important today to have quantitative data. Uh, it's interesting that now I have the quantitative data and it bears out. Uh, when I wrote Among the Bears in 2002, I came to the same conclusions uh, based on observations of very few animals. So these large males would come in during the breeding season, and after the breeding season was over, they'd hang around and take food from the females. Because of their size, they could take food from whoever they wanted. But that didn't last long. In this picture, Squirty weighing about 175 pounds is going after a 350 pound male and asking him to leave. 
I watched her, her daughter SQ2 do a very deliberate, zigzagging, uh, stiff-legged walk in front of one of these large males. He backed off into the bushes like it was no big deal, but in the morning he was gone and he never returned. This suggests that there's a degree of female choice in mating because if there wasn't a repercussion, these large males would stay and compete with the females and their cubs in the female home ranges. The big surprise in my study was there was a number of unrelated females uh, that came into the study site that Squirty shared her resources with. They were all relatives of this bear, a bear we called Moose, and all her female relatives. And when I put Squirty into the wild, uh, she was 17 months old, um, I had put a, a radio collar on one of the cubs and I had led them up on the hill uh, above their cage, thinking they might encounter another bear up there. And uh, I, I walked up and they marked all the way up and they marked all the way back and the next morning they were up on the ridge. I went up to see them. I could get close enough uh, by frequency of the radio to know they could hear me. I called them and they ran on me. And that told me they were with another bear. The next morning I wanted to see what was going on so I waited for the wind to be right. They were in a beach stand and I snuck into the beach stand, except I broke a big stick and scared the cubs. They treed and they started moaning, uh, a, a, a very uh, mournful moan up on top of the tree. And then Moose came over and false charged me, defending my cubs from me. And I, it just blew me away. Why was she risking her life to defend cubs that weren't related to her from the most dangerous creature in the forest? And then finally my scent got up to my cubs. They came down out of the tree. Each one of them came over to me and greeted me nose to nose like bears do. Then they pinned their ears and bit me on the forearms, punishing me for interfering with the time they had with this wild female. And ever since that time, Squirty has allowed Moose and all her female relatives access to the clearing. Not only does she provide them access, but she treats them better than she treats her, only fa her own family members. She, there's much less aggression towards the unrelated females than her family members. And this, I realized, was a huge parallel with human behavior. <laughs> because if you think about it, we're really, we, can, we can say really mean things to our family members. And, and we say th mean things to our family members because they're our closest cooperators and communicating with them is terribly important. As I say, unfortunately, how we do it is not always pretty, but we can get away with it because we can always reconcile with a family member. But you'd never go up to a stranger and rank them out the same way you do family members because that stranger is also a cooperator and you might not be able to reconcile with a stranger. So to see this parallel between these wild bears and, and humans was, was huge. And not only did they have this type of behavior, but uh, Robert Trivers in 1971 wrote a paper on human reciprocal altruism in humans, and he described some psychological conditions that went along with it that had to be there. And they included friendship, gratitude, uh, uh, punishment, judgment, and the bears have all these things. It's, it's not, uh, they're not out there with, with just one type of behavior. So it was a, 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 a pretty remarkable uh, correlation. Male bears were a lot more difficult to study. A female home range is five to 15 square miles. She might travel further in the fall to get food. Uh, but the males can travel over an uh, annual home range of uh, up to 200 square miles. Uh, so. I tried radio collars on males that didn't work. And finally, when uh, trail cameras became available, I started monitoring the extra ba bears in my female home ranges. I noticed in clear cuts, there was a lot of bear sign. I couldn't explain it with a few females that were around. And uh, I started uh, monitoring uh, these clear cuts by putting a gallon bag of corn in front of a trail camera. In this case, I used two. Uh, and it was, wasn't unusual to get eight or ten different males. Uh, I took lots of pictures over many years, well, well into the hundreds of thousands, and it was very difficult making sense out of it. And finally, in 2008, 
I set up in a clear cut that was 16 years old, right at the end of its productivity. The insects were disappearing, the berries were disappearing. I got my eight or 10 different males. In 2009, I set up the same two cameras. The only bear there was the resident female. The males had all moved on to another area of surplus. But the big surprise was in 2008, I got multiple pictures of two males sharing that small amount of corn. That, I knew one large male could eat three gallons of corn and they were happily sharing a gallon of corn. These were not relatives. I've done the DNA of the bears in my study area, uh, the pedigrees. UNH has done uh, the hair samples for me and the males are genetically unrelated. Uh, so this was a sign of male coalitions or friendships and uh, in the case of males, it's not reciprocal altruism because reciprocal altruism requires the time delay. This is a case of mutualism, but still just as interesting because it's between unrelated in individuals. They are cooperating with each other. All of this is about the access to food and in the spring of the year, the bears eat what I call emerging growth. Uh, these cubs are climbing a red oak tree to eat. The oak, oak leaf starts as the buds first break into leaves. They eat a wide variety of, of tree buds and, and leaf starts. Uh, they eat nodding sedge and woodland trails. Uh, they'll eat succulent grass to the edge of agricultural fields. You can drive around sea bears in the springtime. Uh, so there's an abundance of food for the bears uh, in the early spring. And the important thing about it is that it's evenly distributed. It's not uh, high quality. Uh, but it will sustain them and the bears pick their uh, breeding season because of the fact there's very low social competition for food. The female bears come into estrus from the middle of May and continue on until the first week of July. Uh, the male and female bear will spend three to seven days together and the result of that union is a two-celled organism called a blastocyst. They're delayed implanters, so the blastocyst won't implant into the uterus until late November, early December. There's a short gestation period of 50 to 55 days, and the cubs are born in the dead of winter, mid-January, weighing less than a pound. Their eyes are shut, their little ear flaps are down. They continue to develop inside, in the mother's firm, outside the womb, and they don't emerge from the den to early to mid-April. Uh, the first thing the mother bear will do when she emerges from the den is to build a nest at the bottom of a good climbing tree. Uh, she'll coach her cubs the very first time they attempt to climb. Instinctively, they can climb, but they have to learn about rough bark, smooth bark, and the skinny end of a limb. She'll stay at that site for three or four weeks until they're adept at climbing and following her before she moves on to better feeding grounds. When she does, she'll go to a large pine or hemlock that's near water, trees I call babysitting trees. The cubs will play and continue practicing climbing in the trees. They'll sleep in the trees. The mother will radiate out from the base of the tree to forage and feed. Uh, the cubs' toenails are audible on the bark, so if something gets after the cubs, she can return in a hurry to see what's going on. They'll continue to forage and feed in this fashion throughout the summer and fall and they'll den with their mother as yearlings and the family unit will break up the following spring when the male bear shows up. The family breakup is rather abrupt. It goes from a tender scene like this where one of Squirty's granddaughters is removing ticks from her yearling son. And a week later she becomes the till of the hun. This female bear chased her cub up the tree and out on a limb and uh, then she'd go all the way to the bottom of the tree and every time the cub thought about coming down, she'd run back up the tree. I watched her run up that tree nine times in 10 minutes. <laughs> so if you ever wonder how powerful a bear is, try climbing into the apple tree in your backyard. Finally, the male bear shows up. This is Squirty's daughter, SQ2, meeting her mate for the first time. Um, you can see the size difference between the two. Uh, females put all their extra energy into reproduction, 
and the males uh, get as big as possible. It's called sexual dimorphism, uh, so they can compete to mate. You'll see him opening and closing his mouth. He's expelling moist air from his lungs and picking up her condition of estrus on the airwaves. And you also see she's rather aggressive with him. She's been busy with her cubs for 18 months. She doesn't know this big lug very well. And he's calm and collected because he knows exactly what to expect. <laughs> Finally gets up to her and grabs her with his forepaws and bites her behind the neck. All of this aggression and the bite behind the neck help the female stimulate, help, the, help stimulate the female to ovulate precisely at the time of mating, which ensures that conception will take place. This first grasp only lasted a few minutes, and then there was another 20 minutes of pre-courtship behavior around the clearing. I have a set picture section in, out on a limb that shows this at close distance, the males and females standing up, open mouth wrestling each other. It's pretty uh, dramatic behavior. And finally, after 20 minutes, he got a hold of her again. This time they hooked up, they literally hooked up. The male has a baculum or penis bone that locks over the female pelvis. They were locked together for 45 minutes. Uh, during that time, there was another female bear in the clearing who walked by him 10 feet away, rubbernecking as to what was going on. <laughs> 85% of the black bear's diet is vegetative. Uh, the remaining 10 to 15% is animal protein, and of that animal protein, uh, 90 to 95% is ants, bees, and grubs. Having said that, bears are, are opportunistic predators. Uh, they don't respond to movement or sound in the wood like, uh, woods like a, a coyote or a bobcat might. Um, but they will take advantage of any protein they come across. They'll take a fledgling bird off a branch, a bird's nest, a deer fawn in its first week of life. Uh, don't get too horrified because deer, even white-tailed deer, will clean out a bird's nest if they get a chance. And the number one predator of, of warblers is uh, the chipmunk. And it takes a year like this when there are no nuts to kill off all the chipmunks so the warblers have a chance to reproduce. The summer uh, vegetative foods of the black bear are three primary uh, plant groups, jewelweed or touch-me-not that grows in everybody's yard, a succulent, several species of wild lettuce, uh, and the most important is jack-in-the-pulpit. Jack-in-the-pulpit has a root or a corm that's more nutritious than either beech nuts or acorns. So in years like this, they'll rely heavily on jack-in-the-pulpit to get through the year. It's the summer habitat of the black bear that brings people and bears close together. Uh, it's not unusual in New Hampshire for somebody to have an old orchard behind their uh, nicely mowed lawn with maybe three feet of vegetation. A uh, black bear can be out there feeding jack in the pulpit roots and you'd never know it. You'd never know it unless you saw the stompled trails and the occasional divot with the white roots growing into it. You'd never know it unless the black bear stuck his nose up in the air and smelled black oil sunflower seed. Black oil sunflower seed has three times the calories per unit of any of their natural foods. Bears prioritize their food by the quality of food, the quantity of food, and the amount of risk that it takes to get the food. In my experience, uh, black oil sunflower seed is served up between 5 and 35 pounds at a time. So a bear can come into your yard and get a day's pay in about 15 minutes. <laughs> the average black bear needs to put on 50% of its body weight, 30% uh, of its body weight and fat uh, to survive the winter. A female black bear giving birth to cubs needs to put on 50% of her body weight and fat uh, to give birth to cubs and have reserves for them in the early spring. So if you want to understand why bears are so attracted to bird seed and, and your garbage can, just think about how we're attracted to money. After all, we store our money in banks like the bears store their fat uh, for our retirement, to put our kids through school, or to buy fancy toys. And you wouldn't go home in the evening and scatter $100 bills all over your lawn and have the expectation that nobody would pick any of them up. 
<laughs> and that's the same expectation we have with black bears when we have uh, bird seed in our yard and, and wonder why that bear dared be on our deck. <laughs> it's just they're trying to survive. And if there's not much food around like this year, uh, they're going to great lengths uh, to find whatever food they can. The, the normal foods that the bears use to put on the fat to get through the winter and reproduce are in New Hampshire are red oak acorns and beech nuts, red oak primarily in the south and beech nuts in the north. These last year was a, uh, an abundant beech year. These are the bear feeding nests or baskets in the beech trees. If you went out in the winter time, you'd see these. They feed on them in late August, early September while the leaves are still on the trees. And uh, almost every beech tree in New Hampshire got fed on last year. Bears use a number of different types of dens. In this picture, I'm crawling out of an excavated den that Yoda used not only as a maternal den, but a den with her yearlings. She dug it under an old root mass of a tree that had blown over many years before. When I crawled into the den and looked up, the ceiling of the den was a matrix of live roots that prevented the soils from collapsing down around her and her cubs during the winter time. And this is pretty tip typical of, of uh, excavated dens. This bear had a different strategy. This is what we call an open ground nest. Uh, these are right out in the open. They're snuggled up against a log or a tree. They're usually in a blowdown area or an area of dense softwood regeneration. Uh, so dense you could literally walk by one of these dens 10 feet away and never know it was there. Um, bears also use rock dens. These are in the piles of rocks below the ledges around the state. These make our winter den work difficult. I have a cooperative project with New Hampshire Fish and Game where we try to keep GPS collars on 10 wild females. We change collars and batteries during the winter. Fish and Game's interest in, in the health of the bears and the number of cubs that are born and the number that survive as yearlings for their population models. And I'm obviously interested in behavior. Uh, these can be difficult to work because a bear can get into a hole that's not much bigger than its head. Their, shol their shoulders are very flexible, their back is very supple, and they can wiggle down into the rocks that we can in places we can't even think about getting. We thought about designing the perfect UNH student that was skinny, <laughs> flexible, and strong that we could lower down by his bootstraps to pull these bears out, but so far that hasn't worked very well. <laughs> Here's a yearling bear with its mother in a rock den, and the last type of den I'll talk about are tree dens. When trees get to be about three feet in diameter, the center of the tree can decay and rot out, leaving a huge cavity. There may be only two or three inches of live wood. This particular tree was outside of a new residential area in Lyme, and one morning early in April, I got a call from a woman. She said, I have a bear in my tree. And I got there, and sure enough, she had a bear in her tree. And I informed her that the bear had bit in her tree all winter long. <laughs> Bear, I've described a complex social behavior. Well, they also have a complex communication. Squirty in this picture is doing like the large male was. She's opening and closing her mouth, expelling that moist air from her lungs and drawing it back through her olfactory system. Uh, one of the first things I discovered about the bears was with, from my first set of cubs was all the green vegetation they came across that hold in their mouth for a few seconds, a behavior I call mouthing. I hadn't seen it in any other mammal. Uh, I wanted to know what was going on. They weren't damaging the leaf at all. And uh, I started documenting, first learning and then documenting all the different types of plants that went into their mouth. By the end of the summer, the cubs had identified 125 different food items and rejected many, many more. I determined a bear could tell if a plant were edible or not simply by holding it in its mouth for a few seconds. And this lends credence to the fact that Native Americans credited the black bears. They observed them to find out which plants could be used as foods and pharmaceuticals. So something as simple as an aspirin, which we all use, may well, it comes from the willow plant, and may well have had its origins by a Native American uh, watching a black bear eat willow. Uh, bears have emotional expression, which is generally honest. Uh, 
as humans, we have the most complex uh, emotional system of, of emotional communication of any mammal on Earth. Uh, this includes facial expression, body language, intonation of voice, intensity of voice. We have over 3,000 muscles in our face devoted to expression. Uh, we wouldn't be able to meet in this room if we weren't comfortable of, with the emotional state of everybody else in this room, and that's written all over our face. Right now, everybody in this room has a neutral look on their face, something I call subway face. Anywhere you ride in the world, anywhere in the world you ride on a subway, uh, people will have that expression. They're not giving anything up. Uh, but if somebody were up to something in this room, he'd make us all uncomfortable. We'd all know who he was because he wouldn't be able to hide uh, what he was thinking. It would come out on his face. A few years ago, uh, when they tried to catch the Boston bombers, uh, they reviewed the videotapes and they were looking for somebody who was out of the ordinary. And there was these two guys trying to walk casually away while everybody else was horrified. So in this picture, Squirty has an aggravated look on her face. She's just put one of her cubs up a tree at weaning time. She has eyebrow expression, eye expression, uh, general facial expression, and ear expression. When her ears are pinned like those of a horse, it means she's aggravated. And she has many ear positions uh, in between. In this picture, she has a happy face. <laughs> Now, I get told bear stories by lots of people, and I often ask them what the bear looked like, and the answer I always get, it was black. <laughs> Bears also have an expression of intention, and here, this is where I get in trouble with other scientists. There are many scientists who believe that the only animal that, that can communicate intention are humans. Um, but bears have an expression of intention, and I think they have it for the same reason that we have it, and that is to communicate with strangers. Uh, strangers are far more dangerous to communicate with than family members, and bears have to negotiate uh, with strangers all the time, and so do we. If we, we can grunt, around, grunt and groan around our house and everybody knows what's going on, but you go out in the real world, you gotta get it right, or there's ramifications. <laughs> so when a bear, our language is an emotional utterance with a mechanical manipulation of our lips, teeth, tongue, and larynx. So we can lie with our words, but we rely on facial expression and body language to determine if somebody's telling the truth or not. So bears, when they're using an expression of intention, now they mechanically generate sounds and actions. So now they're chomping their teeth, they're huffing, they're swatting, they're false charging, making the guttural sound the male was in the video, which you couldn't hear very well, that oh. And the meaning of these sounds and actions is based on the context of the situation at the time. Uh, so even though they have limited in the number of ways they can communicate, it's greatly broadened with context. And if we pay attention to it, we can understand what a bear is trying to communicate to us. Uh, if, you're, if you're walking down a trail quietly one day and you come across a female black bear that's just having a nice day with her cubs and her cubs scoot up a tree, you suddenly get too close to her, she may uh, lunge at you and expel a big blast of air, false charging you. Your body, bodily fluids may run a little bit. <laughs> but all she's trying to do is, is to delay confrontation long enough for communication to take place. If you hold your position, keep your eyes on her, talk softly to her, let her know that you're not a threat. In three to five minutes, she's going to determine you're not a threat and you can safely walk away. I've spent over three and a half hours with a bear that's false charged me and circled me. When they circle, they just want to know who you are. They want to get, a, get smell your back trail so they can keep a track of you after that. Now, if you're working at a restaurant and a bear false charges you, he simply, and you're, you're headed out to the dumpster, he simply wants you to drop the fruit before you put it in the dumpster. <laughs> I was uh, with Squirty one afternoon in Lyme, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and this thunderhead came rumbling along. She false charged the thunderhead. Believe it or not, the thunderhead turned and left, and the sun came back out. <laughs> now, here's a video of Squirty false charging, and unfortunately, the sound isn't working very well tonight. Uh, but the context was the last film that National Geographic did on my work, A Man Among Bears. 
uh, the film crew showed up and thought they would film Squirty for eight hours. Squirty showed up and thought 35 minutes was more than enough, and this is Squirty telling the film crew to get out. I filmed that with a handheld camera about 10 feet from her. I've been false charged in the thousands of times, and I just listen to the bear and, and accommodate him. In this case, she was perfectly relaxed. She thought about it. Her face got long. She delivered the blow, and then she went back to being relaxed and expected us to leave, and that was the right thing to do. Now, these come in all kinds of intensities. Uh, they can be a, a simple bow. Uh, or depending on how much the bear is bothered, it can be one like you just saw. This next false charge is Squirty's granddaughter, Wanda. And uh, Wanda false charges all the time, but she's never very, uh, it's kind of just that. <laughs> and, then she, and then she walks up to me. Now this next clip is Wanda again. I used this in my uh, dissertation uh, in animal communication talking about intention. And uh, female bears communicate with their cubs using uh, a gulp, which is uh, uh, and a chirp, which is uh, uh. And they use that in syntax with body language. So if, a, if, if the mother bear wants her cubs to go up a tree, she senses danger, she runs towards the tree gulping, the cubs run out ahead of her, they run up the tree, she goes up the tree behind them and sits between them and whatever danger is around. She wants them down, she comes down out of the tree, sits at the bottom of the tree, looks up and gulps, they come down out of the tree, she wants them to follow her off in a certain direction, she walks off and gulps and they follow behind her. And she can manage her cubs very well that way. The unfortunate thing is the meaning of the gulp and the body language is not instinctive. The, she has to teach the cubs the meaning of those uh, communications. So in this, uh, um, again, the sound isn't very good, so you have to listen very hard. But Wanda senses there's another bear around, and she starts to get nervous, and her cubs are oblivious to it. Uh, she'll start by gesturing towards them. Uh, she's alert to that other, to the other bear. She knows it's not far off. The cubs are oblivious. She'll tug at them, trying to get them to follow her away. She'll be gulping and chirping. As she goes away, the cubs are oblivious. <laughs> she realizes they're not behind her. She comes back. The intensity of her gulps and chirps increases. She gets more and more excited. Uh, she, she continues to, to gesture what she wants them to do, even demonstrate what she wants. The cubs are still oblivious. <laughs> she tries pushing them up the tree. <laughs> they still don't have a clue. The other bear is getting closer all the time. She's getting more and more nervous. The cubs are still don't quite get it. Her intensity increases. They don't have a clue. <laughs> and finally, the bear shows up. The cubs respond. They run up the tree, and she runs up the tree behind them. She'll start chomping. The bear will be below her, uh, just below the tree. So early in the summer, these cubs don't know much. Uh, but because there's real danger, and they get to experience it, they start to associate what mom's trying to teach them. And by the end of the summer, they're going to listen to every sound she makes without waiting for the bear to show up. They're going to just go ahead of time. And this, this is, there's some interesting correlations between bears and humans in this regard because, you know, we live in a protected society and uh, human parents have the same difficulty communicating danger to their kids especially in a world of, of iPhones and other things like that where there's invisible danger out there and it's pretty hard to get the message across. But if they, if you, if they got bit right away uh, when something happened, they'd learn very quickly. There, there's a transparency in bears. Um, 
Wherever a bear travels, it deposits a little bit of scent on whatever its fur touches or feet touch the ground. Then another bear can follow for 48 hours or more. Uh, they follow each other to find food and they follow each other to punish. And when I talk about punishment, Squirty manages her greater home range with her family members. Uh, she expects them uh, to obey her rules. She has rules. I've learned about them by working with her. Uh, she's taught me that if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, she bites me. And, uh, and these, uh, with, with Squirty, it's been interfering with another bear or, or, or getting too close to her cubs when they're very young. But uh, I can't run. Uh, her family members can run and tree and get out on a limb and get away from her. Uh, but it's always the granddaughter she has trouble with because the granddaughters knew their mothers had rules, but they didn't know grandma had rules, and, and, and they can't stay in Squirty's home range until they comply to her rules, and they're different than their mother's rules. Uh, so if one bear breaks another bear's rules, they can track them down and punish them at any time. Uh, all, any altruistic animal has to have a ju judicial system, and the bear's judicial system is better than our own uh, because they can track them down and punish them. We have DNA and fingerprinting, but we've got to get it off the perpetrator. We've got to find it at the crime scene, then we've got to find the perpetrator. And that rarely happens. Um, and the bears just can, uh, they know who did it and can track them down. They also follow each other to find food. so. If the bear is fed at your bird feeder, it goes off on into the mountains and leaves the scat. Another bear finds the scat and says, oh, black oil sunflower seed, I wonder where he got it. They follow that trail back to your backyard. <laughs> and if you keep putting your bird feeder out, you're going to have eight or ten bears coming to your yard uh, expecting food. Bears are also deliberate markers. You might argue that the bear in this picture, uh, who's sliding under a sapling, she's depositing sebaceous oil now, which are large molecules of scent carried in the kind of oil we have in our hair. You might argue she's not doing that on purpose, but this is a different bear, the same sapling, and she's pulling it over her back like that, making sure she gets every bit of sebaceous oil on that sapling as possible. Now, we can, we can find bear sign in the woods, and we can only speculate as to what it means. If we see a bear marking, we get a little more information. But bears know what's going on. This is Squirty's daughter, SQ2. She's, uh, it's during the breeding season. She's trying to reconnect with her mate. And they often split up and get back together. Uh, the males are out chasing ladies. And uh, so she's following his scent, that transparent scent, and she's marking over it, leaving him the message if he crosses that double mark trail that she's interested in reconnecting with him. Now, I know it's a male because she's stretching up the tree. Female bears stand five feet tall. Males are about my height. Uh, and there she's de detecting that little bits of scent. She'll do a funny stiff-legged walk, disrupting the soil under her feet. Uh, leaving a symbolic message, and finally she'll walk over a sapling, picking up scent from her underbelly. It'll flip up behind her, acting like an olfactory antenna. Uh, so these bears know what they're communicating. They're out there intentionally communicating with other bears. They have a very active social life and can reconnect at any given time. The most important reason that bears mark is to get together with their mates during the mating season. A female bear know, may know who she wants to mate with, but if he doesn't find her first, she's got to go out and look for him. The males will be advertising on these red pine trees or telephone poles or your favorite, favorite hunting camp, novel objects. They'll back up to the tree, they'll flex their knees and hold their paws out, and then they'll turn their head and bite the tree, releasing aromatic scent from the sap of the tree. Uh, the, the sebaceous oil has very little smell, uh, so it's that releasing of sap that attracts other bears to their mark. Uh, the female will come along, find the male that she wants to mate with. She'll rub on the tree and wait nearby. The male will pick her up and they'll get out of dodge. There'll be uh, four or five sub-adult males that follow the breeding male around, mentoring off him. Uh, so wherever she goes, he follows, and wherever she stops to feed, he'll set up a two-acre territory around her 
doing a heavy stiff-legged walk and, and back rubbing and marking on multiple trees. Uh, here's a 350-pound male traveling with a female during the breeding season and back rubbing. Back in 2008, I started studying a different kind of bear. I, went, I was asked to go to uh, China with a scientific delegation to, to give a presentation similar to what I'm giving you tonight. Uh, they were, the scientists were all talking about the effects of climate change on panda habitat, and pandas are susceptible to, to, te to temperature changes, so it was a big deal. And I was the last speaker, and again, I gave a talk like this. And when I got done, uh, Hurong, who was the director of science and research at the Chengdu Panda Base, came up to me and she said, we noticed your talk was quite a lot different from the other talks. And then she said, you make us think. And <laughs> the next day, I was hustled off to the Department of Forestry that manages the wild panda population in the National Reserves and gave the talk again. And they were very excited about what they heard. And then, tw then four years went by. I didn't hear anything. I thought they'd given up on everything. And, and then I got summoned again to come and give another presentation in China. Uh, they were concerned that if they walked their cubs the way I'd walk black bear cubs, they'd simply run off. And a panda cub is worth a million dollars a year in rental fees to zoos around, around the world. And it's a, a huge source of tourism for the Chinese and it's a national icon, so it would be disastrous for them if their cubs just ran off every time they tried to walk them. And uh, they're also worried that if, I ended, if they ended up with a panda like Squirty that the researchers could travel and work with, uh, that the wild pandas would come and attack them and they wouldn't be safe for their researchers in the forest. So we invited the Chinese to, to come to Lyme. They were coming to the US anyway, to the Drexel English Learning Center. They came up for an extended weekend. Uh, we had six bottle-fed cubs that year. We opened up the cages and took them, the cubs for a walk up on the mountain behind the house. The cubs were only interested in new vegetation. They found a hornet's nest. I took them to a, a bear mark tree. The breeding season had, was, was, had, was just ending. It still had bear scent on it. The cubs all sniffed the tree, got very excited. They came down and did that funny stiff-legged walk and marked with urine. Hurong got very excited. She said the cubs can communicate with the wild bears without even meeting them. And that evening, I took them up to my study site, and Squirty came out with her cubs and several other wild bears, and no bears attacked the truck. They got even more excited. They talked the seven all the entire seven hour trip back to uh, Philadelphia. And the following March, we had the first cubs for the reintroduction program in China. Uh, the, the program has gone slowly. There's a lot of politics in China. This is one of our cubs uh, in a 50 acre enclosure. Uh, it's, it's pretty well grown and uh, the, the nice thing about these pandas is they're easier to work with than black bears. Black bears eat high quality food and have tons of energy. They can wrestle with you all day long. A panda, because of the low quality of its food, has to eat and sleep 23 hours a day and only has about an hour's worth of expendable energy. So if I stand eight feet away from a panda, uh, even though these pandas were all captively raised, he's not going to come over and try to wrestle with me. But if I stand three feet away from him, he's going to come over and try to wrestle with me. So he's calculating the amount of energy that he's got to expend in order to do something he'd like to do. So these, these pandas are masters at energy conservation. And uh, as I say, the program is, is slow. Um, uh, we have two postdocs on the ground in China 24-7. We've been training the Chinese. Uh, we've had panda cubs ready to go out in the wild. Uh, the infrastructure wasn't ready. The Chinese are building uh, big 100-acre uh, enclosures for us and research centers. 
but we've had setbacks like 100-year floods that wipe out the mountain roads and wipe out parts of the enclosure. And uh, the Chinese government, everybody from President Xi all the way down, has something to say about what we do. So it's not as easy as the time I had when I was doing my black bear work. Uh, when nobody looking over my shoulders and just being able to make decisions and solve problems. But we're going forward, the program's still moving along, and we will get uh, cubs and uh, bears out in the wild that we can work with. Uh, right now, IMAX has done a film about my work with black bears and the fact that it went to China. Uh, it's playing down at the uh, aquarium down in Boston and should be there until the first of the year. Uh, it has some nice shots of New Hampshire and then uh, we go to China. Uh, most of the film is shot about pandas in China. Um, and hopefully that it'll start playing in China this fall sometime. Um, but it's been uh, I an interesting experience. I end up tonight with a quick visual. I call it Houdini's Apple Tree Gymnastics, so hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Finally is dismount. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>